welcome those that are joining us from our Olive Drive campus or the Mount Vernon campus or on a computer screen of some kind. We're glad that you are with us. Now, I want us to all open our Bibles together, if you would, to the Old Testament book of Jonah. We're in a series of messages on Sunday morning called Ancient Words for Modern Times. It's a study of each of the 12 minor prophets week by week. That's the last 12 books of our Old Testament. We're looking today at the book of Jonah, a message I'm calling, When We Need More Than a Second Chance. The message of Jonah really is drastically different from that of the other minor prophets. Most of the minor prophets are written in what we call discourse. They're essentially messages or sermons, and, and, and you can nearly feel the passion that these prophets uh, uh, preached with. As occasion, they stood before kings, and they stood on the street corner, and they declared the word of God. Many times, it was a message of judgment. But the book of Jonah is not discourse. It is narrative. In fact, there's very few words uh, in the entire book of Jonah attributed to Jonah other than the prayer in chapter 2. So his message was autobiographical. The message of Jonah is found in the man Jonah himself. That's a familiar story to us. Little children, even in Sunday school, they know this story of Jonah runs from God and his story is inextricably linked to the whale or the great fish. Everyone is familiar with that part of the story, even though they may know very little about the book of Jonah, they know about Jonah and the fish. Clarence Darrow was a famous lawyer in his time. He is the one that was involved in the Scopes trial concerning the evolutionary theory. There was a, a teacher by the name of Scopes in a public school in Tennessee that confessed to teaching evolution, which was against the law at that time. And so Clarence uh, Darrow represented him, and he ultimately lost the case, but then it was overturned later. And it's interesting that in that day, the evolutionary theory was outlawed from public schools. Only creation was taught. Now, evolution is exclusively taught, and creation, for the most part, is outlawed in schools. This uh, shows something of the times, I guess, in which we're living. But Clarence Darrow, on one occasion, was defending someone in a, in a, in a murder trial, and in summation, he was trying to discredit one particular witness that had testified against his client. And he said to the jury, you just as well believe that Jonah was swallowed by a whale to believe this man's testimony. Well, what he didn't realize is there were some God-fearing, Bible-believing Christians on the jury. And as they deliberated, they thought, we believe Jonah was swallowed by a great fish. And so they ended up finding his client guilty. The story of Jonah has been attacked by liberal theologians, perhaps more than any other book in our Bible. The reason is, I think, Jonah is clearly supernatural. God created a great storm. God created a, a great fish. A, a man is swallowed by the fish. He survives three days and nights in the fish. Everything in this book speaks to the supernatural intervention of God in human affairs. Now, the book of Jonah is presented to us as historical narration. There's nowhere in the book that it indicates that it's a parable, or there's no indication that it's allegorical. There's no indication that it's illustrative. It's presented as a historical event. So rationalists have sought to malign the validity of the book of Jonah, and theologians have even argued that it shouldn't be in our Bible. You know what, I, I think it's dangerous for us to read the Bible with a pair of scissors in our hands. To say, well, I accept this because this speaks of my faith and this speaks of the love of God, but I reject this because it doesn't fit my secular view of the world or my rationalistic thinking. Now, as a believer, you don't have to check your brains at the door of the church and in order to worship God. But ultimately, the self-disclosure of God that we call the Bible comes down to a matter of faith. That we place our confidence in the Scripture that it is accurate, not only in matters of faith, but in all matters 
that it endeavors to speak to, that it is the inerrant word of God, recorded by men for us. Most commentaries written on the book of Jonah, their author doesn't even believe the book of Jonah. You can finally, hardly find a commentator that writes on the book of Jonah that believes the story actually happened. As I studied, I thought to myself, why would you write a commentary about the Bible if you don't believe the Bible? I mean, go do something else. That's what I think. But sometimes people will say, well, I'm a Christian, and I believe in the death of Jesus, and I believe in the resurrection of Jesus, but I don't really believe the story of Jonah. Well, listen to what Jesus said about this story. This is found in Matthew chapter 12, verse 39. But he answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign or a miracle, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus tied his prediction of the resurrection to the historicity and the validity of the story of the book of Jonah. If the book of Jonah is a parable, then the resurrection is a parable. If Jonah's story is a myth, then the resurrection of Jesus is a myth. If Jonah's story is legend, then the resurrection of Jesus is legend. But obviously, Jesus believed the story of Jonah and tied it to the great promise that he was given concerning the resurrection. The problem is we concentrate so much on the fish that we lose the message of Jonah. The fish is just the hook in the story. Excuse the pun. But everyone knows the story of the book of Jonah, being that, that Jonah is swallowed by a fish. But, but I wonder if we really understand what the entire book is about. The book of Jonah, in many ways, is about the sovereignty of God, that God is in control. He's in control of a storm that he created. He's in control of a fish. He's in control of the human equation. There's no surprises in heaven. There's nothing that's going to ever happen to any of us that's going to take God by surprise. God is always working behind the scenes of our life, and he knows what's going to happen next year. He knows what's going to happen next week, and he knows about the year after that. That's the sovereignty of God. But the book of Jonah is also about the mercy of God. God has mercy on Jonah. He has mercy on the sailors. God has mercy even on the city of Nineveh. But there's also a missionary theme in the book. It is the only time in the Old Testament where God sends one of his prophets to a non-Hebrew nation to prophesy to them. Now, Amos stood on the street corners of Israel and denounced the sins of Moab. Nahum later prophesied against the Assyrians, and Obadiah denounced the sin of the Edomites, but it belonged to Jonah to be told by God not only to denounce the sin of the Assyrians or the Ninevites, but to go there and preach. Now, God chose the Hebrew people to be his people. Why did he do that? Did he choose them because they were superior intellectually? No. Did he choose them because they were morally superior? No. He chose them that through them would come the law, the commandments of God. Through them would be the prophets, the revelation of God. He chose them to be the light of the world. He chose them really to be missionary people. They were to be an illustration of God's people upon the earth. Other nations were supposed to be able to come to Israel, to the temple, and to Jerusalem, and hear the message of God. But the Jewish people became introverted. They became very sectarian and very exclusive. And they thought, well, we've got God, and God lives in our temple. We don't care really what happens to the rest of the world. They were not missionary at all. And Jonah reflected that attitude. God told him, I want you to go to the Ninevites. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. And he essentially thought to himself, why should I go? I don't want to go because God might spare the Ninevites. And he didn't want anything good to happen to them because they were the enemies of the Hebrew people. That's a picture in some ways of modern churches today. The Bible says that we're to be the light of the world. And it's easy to keep the light in the 
confines of the walls of the church building or our campus. We're to be the salt of the earth, but sometimes we want to keep the salt in the shaker and we kind of stay within the confines of the church and we retreat to the safety of the fellowship of other Christians. The message of Jonah is that the very nature of a relationship with God is we're to be missionary to other nations. But it's not only other nations, it's also our neighbors. Now let's begin the book. Jonah 1. Why? Now the word of Jonah came, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and he went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with him to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Here's the first principle. It is possible even for people of faith to rebel against God in disobedience. Tarshish was a city that is now lost to us, but the Greek historian uh, Herodotus tells us that it was on the coast of southern Spain. That's as far in the opposite direction as you could go from Nineveh. So the word of the Lord came to Jonah and said, go to Nineveh. He steps out of his house and he looks to the left down the long road toward Nineveh, around the Arabian Desert, through the valleys of the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers, and he turns right and he runs. As far as he can go in the opposite direction. The Bible says he went down to Joppa. It says he went down into the ship. Eventually he went down into the sea. And then he went down into a fish. The path away from God is always down. The most miserable person upon this earth it's not the person who is an unbeliever. It is the person who is a believer. They have accepted Christ in their life, and yet they've chosen to live their life out of step with the will of God, out of step with the demands of God upon their life as a believer. And their life takes them down as it did with Jonah. Jonah ran from God, but how are you going to run from God? What a ridiculous picture. And yet the world is filled with people that are trying to run from God. Maybe even in a church there are people trying to run from God. But where are you going to go? Listen to what David uh, said in Psalm 139. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I send her to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. I mean, how are you going to run away from God? Where are you going to go? Now, some people say that Jonah ran from God because of the difficulty of the mission. There, there was a vast desert between him and Assyria and the capital, which was Nineveh, and they were the arch enemies of, of the Hebrew people. So maybe he thought, well, they're going to laugh at me. I don't think he was concerned about derision. He may have been concerned about death. I mean, he probably thought they're going to kill me and torture me. They were a cruel and barbaric type people, but ultimately Jonah ran because he was afraid of success. He gives a hint of that later in the letter. He was afraid that if he went to Nineveh and preached, the people would respond positively and God would spare them and not destroy them. And Jonah was so steeped in bigotry and prejudice towards his enemies that Jonah did not want God to spare them. It's hard for us to imagine the prejudice of that day. Uh, and it was on both sides of the Israelites towards the Assyrians or the Assyrians towards the Israelites. And, and what Jonah's thinking, God, why don't you just go ahead and destroy them? I don't, I don't need to go. You just go ahead and destroy them. And uh, sometimes for you and I, after we've served God in our Christian life for a few years, and maybe we've get, went through some hard times, adversity and problems, and, and we're still living by the principles of God, and we find joy and fulfillment in life. And after a while, we can become complacent and satisfied and think the Christian life's just about us. You see, Jonah's problem was prejudice. Our problem is not so much prejudice as it is paralysis. We tend to forget that there's people all around us that do not know Jesus. And we just dismiss that from our thought. 
Jonah's commission was to go and tell. That's the commission of the New Testament. Now, it's helpful to say, come and listen. I love it when people invite others to church, come and listen. But the real commission is to go and tell. The church is essentially kind of a spiritual boot camp, a rallying point where we get the strength and spiritual strength and insight to go and tell people about Jesus. Now, in chapter 1 and verse 3, it says, but Jonah arose to flee. Then verse 4, it says, but the Lord. I love that contrast, don't you? The contrast is that no matter what you do, God is still going to be after you. He's still going to be a loving God, and he's still going to be involved in your life, and he's going to do his best to bring you back into a relationship and fellowship with him. And so God prepared this great storm. You read about it in chapter 1 if you want to. The ship is being tossed about, and the sailors on board, they're upset. They go down to the bottom of the ship, and there's Jonah the prophet, sound asleep, And the soldiers and their superstition said, someone has offended their God. So they woke up Jonah and he confessed, it's me, it's me. I'm running from God. Well, how can we settle this, Jonah? He said, well, the the storm, the sea will be calm if you just throw me overboard. He didn't even want to live anymore. Well, they didn't want to do it. They were afraid it would make God even madder, you know, is how they were reading it. And so they rowed as hard as they can. Finally, it was obvious everything was going to be lost. So they threw him overboard, and immediately the storm subsided. Now, Jonah didn't want to preach to people who were racially and ethnically different from himself. But chances are, none of those sailors were Hebrews. They were probably Phoenicians. They, they, They were racially and ethnically different from himself. But look at their reaction. This is in chapter 1, verse number 16. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. They made vows. All of a sudden, they're saying, let's follow Jonah's God. Jonah didn't want to preach to anyone, but it was a Hebrew. And now all these pagan soldiers... They say, let's follow Jonah's God. Isn't that ironic? He doesn't want to preach to the Hebrews, and now the first converts are non-Hebrews. Look what it says in verse number 17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and nights. Here's the principle. During times of failure, we should seek to reconnect to God in prayer. Chapter 2, verse 1. Then... Right after he swallowed, then Jonah prayed uh, to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish and said, I cried out to the Lord in my affliction, and he answered me out of the belly of Sheol, I cried, and you heard my voice. Jonah's still in the belly of the fish, and he's praying. Now, my theory is this. That probably 90% of people swallowed by a fish and are still alive, they would be praying. In fact, You know, I'm going to dare say that the percentage would be higher than that. What do you think? We're we're tempted, though, to concentrate on what's going on inside the fish, and we miss what's going on inside of Jonah. He he prays this very honest prayer. In verse number 3, he says, and he's talking to God, You cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. Your billows and your waves passed over me. He recognized it wasn't just the soldiers that tossed him overboard, it's God. And he's acknowledging that he had forsaken God, but that God had not forsaken him. There's an element of faith in that. And then in verse number 8, those who regard worth as idols forsake their own mercy. You can nearly hear as he says that there's sorrow for his sin. He goes on to describe salvation as of the Lord in, in verse number 9. And he says, but I will sacrifice to you with a voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Now, that was a revolutionary thought to a Jew at that time, to think that God was about grace. They thought for the most part, their, their righteousness was established by the keeping of the commandments of the law. But Jonah in the belly of the fish said, salvation is of the Lord. It's not of my works. It's not anything that I can do. It's a matter of grace. Also, he said, I will sacrifice to you with a voice of thanksgiving. And we're tempted to say, well, yeah, I would give thanks too if I was swallowed by a whale and spit up on dry ground. Wait a minute. He's still in the belly of the fish when he starts giving thanks. He hasn't read Jonah chapter 3. 
He doesn't know he's going to get out alive. He thinks with his dying breath, I am going to give thanks to God. And he starts getting right with God. He meets God inside the belly of that fish. You know, whatever it takes to turn you to Christ is a small price to pay. It may be suffering that causes you to come to Christ. I've seen that happen so many times. People come to Christ in a time of crisis. It may be the death of a loved one. But whatever it takes to bring you to Jesus is really a small price to pay. We sometimes stop our feet and say, I don't want this adversity. I don't want this trial, this awful thing in my life. Yet at times it's the very thing that is driving us to God. He makes a new commitment in verse 9. He says, I will pay what I vow. I'm going to keep my commitment. So he doesn't even know he's going to get out of the fish. You know what most of us would have done inside the fish? If we didn't have our Boy Scout pocket knife, we would have been playing a game. Let's make a deal, God. God, if you get me out of this son of blubber, I'll preach in Nineveh. I'll do what you want me to do. But a deal presupposes mutual need. Jonah doesn't seek to manipulate God. He's not making that kind of promise to God. He's saying, if I die in this fish, I'm going to die praising God. Verse number 10. So the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry ground. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach uh, to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah rose and went to Nineveh. Nineveh was an exceeding great city. Here's the principle. Purpose of life is found in our obedience to God. God gave Jonah a second chance. You know why? Because that's who God is. When Peter denied the Lord... Jesus gave him a second chance, and he ended up preaching on the day of Pentecost. When John Mark deserted the Apostle Paul in a missionary trip, God gave him a second chance, and he wrote the book of Mark. The message of the Bible is that God will give you a second chance. And you say, well, well I, you don't know what I've done. I've sinned against great light. I understood who God was. I understood God's grace. God will give you a second chance, and even more. In Proverbs, there's a verse that I love, a just man, it says, falls seven times, yet he rises up again. He fumbles, he stumbles, he falters, he falls, but he gets back up. Why? Because God is a God of a second chance. No matter what you've done. One of the most repeated phrases in the book of Psalms, or really one of the most repeated phrases in all the Bible is, his mercy endureth forever. His mercy endureth forever forever. That means that God loves you. Our, our culture thinks when they think about Jonah, if they ever think about Jonah, is that Jonah messed up and so God was going to zap him. Jonah messed up so this great fish was there to punish him. The fish wasn't punished to punish Jonah. The fish was transportation to get him back to the shore so he could go to Nineveh. There's a big difference between punishment and correction. Parents should never punish their children. Instead, you should correct your children with the goal of making them better. God does not punish his children. He corrects us. He chastises us. And sometimes he allows whales in our life. He did with Jonah. Not, not always the swimming kind that gobble you up, but other whales of circumstances. That's not God zapping you. That's not God being mad at you. That's not God taking vengeance because you've sinned. That is a loving God trying to bring you back to a place of repentance. The fish spit him up on dry ground. That means he got really close to the shore, right? Spit him all the way up under the beach. Maybe some old guy was fishing that day and saw Jonah spit up on the shore. He couldn't wait to get back to the bass club to tell him what had happened. You know, <laughs> What a fish story that guy had. But I love what it says in verse 2 of chapter 3. God said, arise and go to Nineveh. That's the same thing he said in chapter 1 originally. We find our purpose in obedience to God. You're going to find God at the point where you left him. 
You look at your Christian life and you perhaps drifted from God. Maybe you didn't run away like Jonah, but you've drifted. And you ask, well, where did the spiritual decline, where did the declension begin? Maybe you were saved, you were baptized, you were so excited coming to church and growing in grace and knowledge. Then at some point, the Spirit of God impressed upon you about something in your life, and you said no. Maybe it was to start tithing, you said no. Maybe it was to become a missionary like Jonah, and you said no. Maybe it was to release someone in forgiveness, and you said no. Or maybe there was bitterness in your life, and God said, I want that out of your life, and you said no. And your life has been drifting spiritually ever since. You're going to find God at the point that you left him. Wherever it was that you said no, that's where you find him. Maybe it was an attitude in your life. Maybe God wants you to make restitution, make something right regarding a wrong that you had done against someone, and you refused to do it, and your heart became hard. You'll find God where you left him. So Jonah goes to Nineveh, that great city. It was such a large city that the Bible says God said there were 120,000 who didn't know their right from their left hand. He's talking about infants or, or little children. And so if there was that many children then it had to be a city of at least 600,000 people. And amazingly, the whole city turns to God. It's the greatest revival on record. Jonah preached a very short message, the same sermon over and over. He just walked through the streets and he'd find a street corner and he preached the same message and half a million people got saved. It was really a message of doom. He said this, God is going to destroy this city in 40 days. And the king... And everyone repented because they believed not only Jonah, but they believed God. Now think about it. This is a city they had no Bible. They had only one preacher, and he had only one sermon. And they got right. We live in a culture where there's so much light. The gospel is preached on television, radio. It's up in billboards, newspaper ads, churches on every street. They believe, and yet our culture does not. One last principle. Sometimes we develop the attitude of grace for us, but judgment for others. Here's what happened after they believed. Chapter 4, verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you're a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in love and kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Jonah had been obedient to God to go to Nineveh, but it turns out he was still a bigot, prejudiced against the Assyrian people. And he said, I'll go and preach. And I'm going to preach that in 40 days they're going to be destroyed. Now, God, you do your part and you destroy them. But they repented. And Jonah's upset. They were his enemies. Now, 100 years later or so, God allowed the city to be destroyed because of sin. But not then. Jonah's arguing. Saying, God, this is why I ran in the first place. You're so gracious. I knew you would spare them. You see the blackness of this man's heart at this point? It's kind of like the disciples in the New Testament. They, they, they preach in a city in Samaria, and, and, and people didn't believe. And they go to Jesus and say, Jesus, let us call some fire and brimstone down on these people. They wanted justice for everyone else. They wanted mercy for themselves. It was days before that Jonah said salvation is of the Lord. It's all about grace. In that fish, he wanted grace for himself. But now he wants justice for everyone else. And we're like that so many times. We're so quick to condemn people who are different from us politically. People maybe of a different nation. We who have experienced the grace and the mercy of God, yet we want God's judgment Want God to teach other people a lesson? He goes up on a hilltop overlooking Nineveh, and he's just waiting, you know, for God to zap him. He's waiting for the fire to fall. 
He sits under the hot sun. He's kind of pouting because so many people repented. And a gourd vine grows up overnight. This is in chapter 4. And so he built a little lean-to, and this gourd just covered it. So now at least he has some shade. And he thinks, well, maybe God hasn't forgotten me after all. God provided this shade. The next night, God creates a little worm with a big appetite. And the worm destroys the gourd vine. Then God causes a hot wind to blow, scorching Jonah. And now Jonah's mad again. He said, God, you gave me this shade and this gourd, and now you killed this poor little gourd. This is one of your created things, God. You killed it. God, in essence, says, listen to yourself. You're grieved over a gourd. Verse 10. But the Lord said, you, you have had pity on the plant for which you've not labored nor made grow, which came up in the night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much livestock? God says, Jonah, there are 120,000 children in this city, and you want me to destroy them? There's a half a million people there, and you're not grieved over their soul? You see, Jonah thought he knew God, but he didn't grieve over what God grieved over. He didn't rejoice over what God rejoiced over. And God essentially told him, your priorities are messed up, Jonah. And expose these pettiness. The book just ends that way. It ends with no clear resolution. Sometimes that's life. Now I assume that Jonah was given a second chance and even more because he wrote the book. So I assume he got right with God even after that. Let me ask you about your priorities. Are they selfish? Sometimes we kind of stomp our feet and we say, God, why are you allowing this in my life? Why don't you fix this? Why are you allowing this bad circumstance in my life? Why do you allow me to lose money or lose my job? What about the shade in my life, God? What about the comfort in my life? And at the same time we're asking that, we live in a city. We live in a culture, a nation of millions of people who do not know Christ. And we're concerned about our own shade. And we grieve over our circumstances. And we don't grieve over what breaks the great heart of God. If we could just look around and see the world for a few moments through God's eyes. The lostness of humanity in our city. Of our friends. Of our neighbors. God showed Jonah how ugly and how wrong his priorities were. That's what this book is about. It exposes who we are and what we should be. Maybe like Jonah today, you need a second chance. Or maybe like Jonah, you've burned through your second chance. And you need a third chance or more. God sends ready to forgive. You know why? Because his mercy endureth forever.